Okay. The committee will come to order. It has been nearly four years since Hurricane Katrina devastated the New Orleans region. Since then, the area has struggled to regain its footing and slowly rebuild its neighborhoods, businesses, and critical services. One area particularly hard hit by the storm was the region's health care infrastructure. When Katrina flooded the city and surrounding parishes, many important hospitals and outpatient clinics were severely damaged and destroyed. Before the storm, the low-income population of the region often relied on hospital emergency rooms and outpatient clinics, mostly hospital-based, as its main source of primary care. Charity Hospital, which was the major public hospital and a source of many of these services, particularly for the working poor and uninsured, was flooded and essentially destroyed. It remains shuttered today. Because this and other critical health care facilities were destroyed, many of the region's residents struggled to obtain health care after the storm. Those facilities that remain open, particularly those willing to take the uninsured or poor, had limited capacity and significant waiting times. While eventually some organizations were able to open some clinics, major health care delivery gaps remained for months and even years after Katrina. In July 2007, the Department of Health and Human Services, with money granted from Congress to restore the Gulf Coast region, provided a $100 million grant to the state of Louisiana. This funding, called the Primary Care Access and Stabilization Grant, was designed to restore the ex and expand critical primary care services to the region without regards to a patient's ability to pay. The grant was also intended to reduce costly reliance on emergency room use for primary care services for patients who were uninsured, underinsured, or covered by Medicaid. The good news is that an impressive network of health clinics has emerged, which are now providing critical health care services. As of June 22, 2009, over $80 million of the $100 million federal grant had been distributed, and these clinics are now collectively providing care for over 160,000 individuals in the Katrina-affected region, nearly half of whom are uninsured. However, because the region does not have a clear plan on when it will begin breaking ground on a replacement for Charity Hospital, and because there are no clear plans on how to financially sustain these clinics, part of the region's population faces an uncertain future. I am particularly interested in understanding what needs to be done to ensure that we preserve the critical health services these clinics are currently providing. In addition, it has now been more than four years since Hurricane uh, Katrina destroyed Charity Hospital. While a temporary facility is providing critical care to the region, we will hear today that this interim hospital is reaching capacity. Four years is long enough for a plan for a replacement facility to sit in limbo, and I look forward to hearing how and when we can expect a new hospital will be built. Let me conclude by thanking our witnesses today, uh, particularly those who have traveled from New Orleans region to be with us today. We really appreciate you, your, your being here. Many of you were in the trenches in the hours and days following the storm and provided critical care to those who otherwise would have gone without, and we thank you for that. Your story is an important one and needs to be heard. I applaud your efforts, and I am sure all my colleagues remain committed to helping you rebuild the New Orleans region. And today's hearing is one more step towards that end. Uh, I will now um, recognize the ranking member, Mr. Darrell Issa of California, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this important hearing. Although the devastation of Hurricane Katrina occurred over four years ago, its effects on New Orleans, the New Orleans region is st still being felt by its residents today. The health care infrastructure was hit especially hard and has not fully bounced back. The picture of health care in New Orleans area is still very bleak. 
hospitals remain shuttered, physicians are short in supply, and many residents, as you said, nearly half are uninsured. A key <coughs> A key number of hospitals that served the uninsured population prior to Hurricane Katrina remain closed. As a result of these closures, many New Orleans residents now go to outpatient clinics for care. The, the change, this change and the causes necessary are our focus here today and, in fact, how to get to a healthier community with a permanent hospital remains a vexing problem that we will hear about today. Receiving early care and proper treatments will reduce overall cost and certainly reduce the strain on emergency rooms. A primary care focus can reduce overall health care spending by eliminating emergency room cost, uh, room cost shifting. Unfortunately, many clinics are filled to capacity in the region, and as you said, Chairman, the economic conditions in New Orleans continue to prevent the the rebounding of the robust economy that could, in fact, fund new hospital uh, maintenance on a permanent basis. The Federal Government has limited resources. It is clear that we have to work together to find a way for the region to be self-sustaining when possible. But today we will hear that that is not possible today. Certainly we will also hear that a leading factor in the nationwide physician shortage is the high cost of medical liability insurance and malpractice insurance. As a result of a broader health care reform is, is needed here in Congress, we need to look seriously at tort reform and bring health care costs that make delivery systems so expensive and inefficient down. Additionally, as the, as the Chairman knows, public house, hospitals today in, have certain limited immunity from tort. Bills being considered in the Congress here today would strip that immunity, thus raising the cost of public health and their liability insurance. So I hope in addition to dealing with the devastation of Hurricane Katrina that lingers on in New Orleans, we will recognize that there is not unlimited amounts of money to pay for health unless health can be delivered in an efficient and effective fashion. Today we will look at whether or not we can restore New Orleans' ability to have primary health care delivered in a way that is sustainable, cost effective, and will prevent the citizens from having either poor health or excessive uh, trips to the emergency room. So, Chairman, I thank you for your, uh, your holding this hearing and yield back. Thank you very much for your, your statement and, uh, and also your involvement in, in this issue over the years. Um, I would like to uh, introduce our first panel of witnesses that will be testifying today. Uh, first is Ms. Cynthia Abassetta, Director of Health Care, United States Government Accountability Office. Um, Dr. Karen B. DeSalvo, Vice Dean of, for Community Affairs and Health Policy and C. Thorpe Ray Chair in Internal Medicine at Tulane University School of Medicine. I'd also like to introduce Ms. Alice Kraft Kearney, Executive Director of the Lower Ninth Ward Health Clinic in New Orleans. Uh, Dr. Donald T. Irwin, President and CEO of the St. Thomas Community Health Center in New Orleans. And Dr. Michael G. Griffin, President and CEO of Daughters of Charity Services of New Orleans. And Dr. Roxanne A. Townsend, Assistant Vice President of Health Systems for Louisiana State University, and Dr. Diane Rowland, Executive Director and Vice President of the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a long-standing policy that all of our witnesses are sworn in. So if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If so, please answer in the affirmative. Right, you may be seated. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses have answered <coughs> in the affirmative. Dr. Uh, DeSalvo, uh, why don't we start with you, okay? And thank you again for coming. Thank you. 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Karen DeSalvo, and I'm a practicing primary care physician in New Orleans. I also serve as the director of the Tulane University Community Health Centers. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of my team and our patients and to update you on the progress of health sector recovery in New Orleans, the challenges ahead for sustainability of the community health network, and describe, describe strategies that may help us sustain these gains. In a now too familiar story, the failure of the federal levy levies in August 2005 resulted in the devastation of the greater New Orleans community, including our health sector. In the face of this crisis, the, the community realized we had a chance not just to rebuild our city, to, but to remake it into one worthy of our historic importance to our nation, one that could be a model for others. This vision extended to redesigning our health sector into one that would provide all our citizens with access to high quality, affordable health care. The rationale for remaking our health sector was simple. For decades, it had performed amongst the worst in quality, cost, and disparities. Any discussion of, the, of a redesigned New Orleans health sector has to include consideration of the role of the public hospital. The Medical Center of Louisiana at New Orleans, formerly known as Charity Hospital, served as the principal source of care for hundreds of thousands of uninsured and underinsured persons in the region. Yet in spite of good intentions, at the time of the storm, the system was overwhelmed and underfunded. Primary care services offered limited hours that reflected the schedules of medical student, trainees, and other doctors rather than patients. They generally did not see the same doctor on recurrent visits, and if they missed an appointment, it was a 12-month wait until the next available one. Most of the uninsured received their care through emergency rooms as a result, and there was also not an alternative network of community care to pick up the slack. When Charity closed because of the Katrina-related flooding, its patients lost access to the chief source of care available to them. Into the vacuum created by this closure, a grassroots, largely volunteer effort emerged to provide care. Tulane's part in this was initially led by a handful of our medical residents who set up six urgent care stations on the streets of New Orleans. While the city was still under mandatory evacuation and partially flooded, You can go to the next slide. These trainees realized that people would need care, particularly the low-income and marginalized populations that Tulane had cared for at Charity for the past 170 years. One of these makeshift first aid stations evolved into a permanent primary care site, Covenant House. When the dust had settled, stakeholders set to work to define a vision for our rebuilt health system. We envisioned one founded upon community health care marked by quality and efficiency. Because the evidence is clear that this kind of framework leads to better health and it also leads to lower costs. The public hospital needs to be part of this new model, but it should not be the sole source of the primary care safety net. In the spring of 2007, I testified along with others about the challenges in health care recovery in post-Katrina New Orleans. We were less than two years from the disaster at that point and had much work to do to rebuild. The community was unified in asking for assistance to shore up what had become our new paradigm of health care in our recovering city, community health. The result of that hearing was the awarding of the Primary Care Access and Stabilization Grant, a reflection of the bipartisan support for the community-based model of care. Tulane has used these PCHG funds to expand access to thousands by increasing capacity at our main site, Covenant House. That once makeshift first aid station has grown into a robust, comprehensive, NCQA-recognized, patient-centered medical home. Our team is proud to have built a program that offers primary care for all ages. We have on-site integrated mental health and resiliency programs. We offer social work and legal aid services. We use an electronic health record. And we have an active quality improvement and evidence-based medicine programs. We're engaged in workforce training for physicians, nurses, social workers, public health students, and pharmacists, all in partnership with local universities. We also partner actively with community organizations and members to empower them to become physically, mentally, and economically healthier. Demand for our services has been so high that we've outgrown our space and will soon move to a new location in the same neighborhood. Our new site will be a renovated building that has been blighted since Katrina and will serve as a cornerstone of economic development for that neighborhood. Tulane has also expanded beyond Covenant House, due in large part to the PCASG funding. We provide high quality, culturally competent care throughout the city from, from mobile units, school-based health centers, and a new primary care site in collaboration with the Mary Queen of Vietnam Community Development Corporation in New Orleans East. The people we serve are mostly the working poor. Their employers do not offer health insurance, and they are not poor enough to be eligible for Medicaid. Others have lost their insurance recently when they have lost their jobs, like a man I saw recently in New Orleans East. He'd been laid off and was newly uninsured. He developed a new problem that caused him to visit the emergency room the night before he had been diagnosed with painful gout. 
This is a genetic condition he suffers through no fault of his own and, was, and it was exacerbated by his compliance with his blood pressure medications. The emergency room knew of our services, sent him to us, and now he is integrated into our medical home and has, has a medical team that will help him manage his care and he will not need to rely on emergency rooms in the future. I'm quite, quite proud of what we have accomplished as an individual organization, but perhaps more proud of the collective efforts. I believe our experience is a model program for other urban areas. However, my enthusiasm is tempered by the knowledge that in the fall of 2010, the funding comes to an abrupt halt. The quality network of care for our population of largely uninsured working poor will need to be scaled down dramatically, perhaps as much as 40 percent, leaving some 50,000 citizens or so without access to primary care and community health. We will lose our gains from this investment and tens of thousands of citizens will have to revert to the old option of using expensive emergency rooms, which the taxpayers ultimately bear the burden of cost. Tulane community health programs will not be immune from these cutbacks. To prevent the loss of gains from this investment, a set of strategies are needed and none alone are likely to be sufficient. Some will be, some are within the control of the community Dr. health Sel providers Selvo, themselves. Dr. would you wrap up please because yes. you'll be on your five uh, minutes. Yes, sir. Um, these include improving efficiency and business practices at the centers, which we have undertaken. Other actions are, are beyond our control and include options such as working with HRSA for community health center programs and creating ongoing funding for uncompensated care in much the same way hospitals are supported in the DISH programs. We look forward to working with you in the ways in which we can sustain this vital component of New Orleans recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. To the other witnesses, um, because we have so many witnesses today, we want to try to stay within the five minutes. And if there are things that, uh, what well, we have your written statements, and if there are things that you uh, need to add, you can possibly add them during the question and answer period. Thank you very much. Mrs. Massetta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. We appreciate the opportunity to be brought together this morning to discuss the important issues involved in restoring health care services in New Orleans. The pre-Katrina health care infrastructure was hospital-based, very expensive, and yielded generally poor outcomes. As you know, many low-income and uninsured people traveled downtown to get their care in emergency rooms and clinics at Charity Hospital. A better system would be built on a solid foundation of primary care that would <clears throat> excuse me, that would be located closer to people's homes and would be accessible as their health care needs arise, that would provide continuity of care over the long term, and that would coordinate care for people with chronic or more serious conditions who need to see specialists. Health services research indicates that primary care also yields better health outcomes at lower costs. So building primary care in New Orleans became a key priority in the wake of Katrina, especially for those on Medicaid or without adequate insurance. My testimony today is based largely on our July 2009 report on the use of federal funds to support primary care in the area. The lion's share of the money, as you know, was the $100 million PCASG grant. Lesser amounts of federal funds were provided through the Social Services Block Grant and the Professional Workforce Supply Grant, as well as more recent American Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act funds for enhanced Medicaid payments and additional federally qualified health centers. The PCSG is intended to restore and expand access to primary care, including mental and dental services, as well as referral to specialty care and ancillary services like transportation. In addition, the organizations must have had the intent to be sustainable, that is, to be able to continue providing primary care after the grant ends in September 2010. So far, the 25 funded health care organizations have provided more than 1 million health encounters to over 250,000 patients. After the storm, provider shortages were a major reason for disruption in health services. We found that the grant organizations used the funds to hire and retain physicians, nurses, and other providers. They told us that this allowed them to increase access by cutting waiting times and expanding their hours. Mental health services were especially hard hit. HRSA's area resource file documented a 21 percent decrease in the number of psychiatrists in Greater New Orleans between, 19, between 2004 and 2006 compared to a 3 percent increase in counties nationwide. Ten of the PCASG organizations hired both medical and mental health providers to alleviate service gaps, and 15 of 18 we interviewed for our report on mental health services for children 
identified the lack of providers as a significant barrier. Other funds were used to renovate or relocate physical space so that providers could expand capacity through additional examination rooms and the purchase of new equipment. Despite the progress made, PCSG organizations face challenges in establishing a full continuum of care with referrals to specialists, and they are concerned about their long-term sustainability. Most continue to have difficulties hiring and retaining staff due to persistent problems with housing, schools, and the overall community infrastructure in the greater New Orleans area. In fact, HRSA has designated all four parishes as a health professional shortage area for mental health, a designation that none had before Katrina, <clears throat> and most of the parishes as shortage areas for primary care and dental services. In addition, financing poses serious challenges. Although Medicaid billing has increased and some are able to bill private insurance, at more than half of the organizations, most of the patient population, and sometimes 70%, are uninsured. This is a daunting demographic given that nearly all the funding is temporary. Many reported that they intended to use health center program funding to improve their sustainability, but with only 16% <clears throat> of applicants awarded grants nationwide in fiscal year 2008, it's unlikely they would all be successful in obtaining a grant. LPHI provided a sustainability strategy guide to help them address a possible $30 million annual shortfall in revenues. Recipients have completed and planned actions to be sustainable, but it is not clear which ones will be successful and how many patients they'll be able to serve after the funds are no longer available. With less than 10 months remaining, quickly implementing ways to pay for the large number of uninsured patients will be necessary to prevent disruptions in these vital services and to prevent the erosion of gains made in delivering primary care through this grant. Thank you very much. Ms. Graf Kearney. Good morning, Chairman Towns and members of the committee. I am Is Alice your mic Graf on? Oops, mic on. Good morning. There you go. There you go. You're on. Chairman Towns and members of the committee. I'm Alice Kraft Kearney, and I'm the executive director of the Lower Ninth Ward Health Clinic in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here to discuss the successful partnership of government and community to deliver health care services to the citizens of the New Orleans region. I want to first express my appreciation for the Primary Care Access and Stabilization Grant which has been a lifeline for the uninsured and underinsured residents of the greater New Orleans area. The grant has enabled the Lower Ninth Ward Health Clinic as well as other health clinics to employ medical staff and provide health care services in New Orleans, which has been designated, as we said, as a medically underserved area. It is my hope that Congress will recognize the critical need for our health clinics and take action to continue this fruitful collaboration which contributed significantly, significantly to the recovery of the greater New Orleans region. Before Hurricane Katrina, I worked as a nursing supervisor at the charity hospital and the trauma surgery wards. And during that time, I observed many patients that were not insured. And the reason why they were there were because they didn't have access to primary health care services. And these were unnecessary hospitalizations. But to understand fully what is going on, you have to understand that community which was most impacted by Katrina. You have to understand that this population was very vulnerable, and they had poor out health outcomes because there were large numbers of New Orleans residents living or at uh, the poverty level. There was low education levels and high literacy rates. There was a high dependence on the public sector for health care needs. There were high rates of chronic illnesses, high numbers of, I said, uninsured residents, and the use of the emergency room was substituted for primary health care. And there was an inadequate um, emergency preparedness. And on August 29, 2005, these factors collided with the worst natural and man-made disaster in the history of the United States, creating a public health crisis of enormous proportions. Ms. Patricia Berryhill, a registered nurse, 
and my colleague and I decided to confront the crisis head on by opening the Lower Ninth Ward Health Clinic on February 27th in 2007. This was a humanitarian mission that we have undertaken at the Lower Ninth Ward Health Clinic and it is informed by the United Nations guiding principles of internally displaced people. On a standard of care that is supported by the U.S. government to ensure the recovery of people around the world who have become displaced by a disaster. Principle 19 of the guiding principle calls for comprehensive medical care and special attention to the health needs of displaced persons. For displaced New Orleanians, these health needs involve the traumatic experience of the disaster and being uprooted from home as well as the physical impacts of not having access to life-sustaining medications and treatment. And as time passed, no one came to the Lower Ninth Ward, a community separated from the rest of the city by a waterway called the Industrial Canal. And historically, the Lower Ninth Ward was the last to obtain any services. With that knowledge, we opened the Lower Ninth Ward Health Clinic in order to improve medical care, needed by internally displaced people returning to New Orleans, many of whom have a history of inadequate medical attention. Initially, the clinic was staffed by volunteer medical providers at a time when many medical professionals who lived in the city were physically displaced by the disaster. It was largely through the primary care access and stabilization grant that we were able to access the funds to employ and stabilize the medical staff, purchase medications, medical equipments and supplies, and contract services for laboratory tests. The grant also provided us with the capacity to raise funds from other sources. Today, the Lower Ninth Ward Health Clinic is proud to report that it employs two part-time physicians with significant medical experience two medical assistants, one clinical director, and one executive director. We serve more than 2,200 patients on an ongoing basis and over 5,000 patients through initial medical visits. We are grateful to provide a service that has not only contributed to the medical progress and positive outcomes of our patients, but also to their recovery and to the recovery of New Orleans. While we have made incremental progress, there is still much work to be done in the areas of quality improvement and disparity reduction. With the adversity of this disaster, there was also an opportunity to discard ineffective treatments and try new and innovative therapies to improve quality of care and reduce disparities. The positive health care outcomes to date have been realized in large part because of the funding of the Primary Care Access and Stabilization Grant, we are eternally grateful to all members of Congress and commend past Secretary of Health and Human Services Michael Levitt for his service and his leadership, as well as his insightful actions which aided the New Orleans region in receiving much needed funding for health care services. We are looking forward with great anticipation to future public-private collaborations which enhance and sustain the health care status of citizens of our region. And we are at a pivotal moment in the evolution of providing excellent health care services. We must not forget we have an opportunity to change the trajectory of internally displaced people. We are now positioned to do phenomenal things to improve the health and welfare of the people of New Orleans and the Gulf Coast region. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your statement. Um, Dr. Irwin. Good morning. Is it on? Yes. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank the chairman and members of the committee for their continued interest in the health care situation post Katrina in New Orleans and for the opportunity to appear here today. I'm Don Irwin, CEO of St. Thomas Clinic, which was, is number 54 on the map that you have. It was started in 1987 as a community-based uh, clinic in one of the country's oldest housing developments. Prior to Hurricane Katrina, the focus was its neighborhood, and our programs de were defined by the availability of public and private grants. The budgets were small, services were limited. After Hurricane Katrina, through the generosity of many, the clinic reopened to provide health care for returning citizens and has since become one of the community's largest and most comprehensive primary care centers. 
With the PCASG funds, St. Thomas has gone from 2.4 FTE providers to eight primary care and mental health providers. We now have a staff of 45 people and an op annual operating budget of $4.5 million. We have a patient base of 14,000 patients and provide over 22,000 patient visits per year. Although we use an open access appointment model, we are still not able to meet the need. Prior to Katrina, we saw patients from three to five local zip codes. Last year, we saw patients from 251 zip codes in three states. In addition to primary care, collaborations have been made to provide our patients with specialty care in seven major medical specialties. The specialty care offered in a primary care setting provides coordinated patient-centered care in a cost-effective way. We're also a training site for medical students, residents, and nurse practitioners. As part of the CDC-sponsored National Breast and Cervical Early Detection Program administered by the LSU School of Public Health, St. Thomas provides <coughs> early breast cancer early detection with digital mammography and ultrasound. For, a year, for over a year after Katrina, we were the only mammography site for uninsured women, and we continue to be one of only two in the region. Through a unique collaboration with Oxner Clinic Foundation and the Association of Black Cardiologists, St. Thomas offers interventional cardiovascular care for the prevention of heart attacks, stroke, and sudden death. For uninsured patients, this <coughs> cardiovascular care is generally unavailable or delayed for months. Included in my written testimony is a copy of a cardiac tracing shows an implantable defibrillator operating to save the life of a 52-year-old working man <clears throat> who has a wife and two children. He was at work when he had an episode of silent ventricular fibrillation and the defibrillator saved his life. Although these defibrillators cost 50000 each, we have installed 14 of them in uninsured patients with both the defibrillators and the cardiologist time being donated to St. Thomas. I would like for you to understand that this, is just, this, this man is just one of the many thousands of lives that have been saved by this grant and the services provided. All of the specialty services that we have available at St. Thomas are offered to any, of the, any patient of any of the safety net clinics in New, the New Orleans community. As a result of the in infrastructure made possible by the Primary Care Access and Stabilization Grant, St. Thomas has become a federally qualified center, health center and also a level three patient-centered medical home recognized by the National Committee for Quality Assurance. We were recently notified that St. Thomas will be honored at, by the American College of Physicians, um, <clears throat> the second largest physician group in the United States, which is this year awarding St. Thomas its Rosenthal Award for the original approach to the delivery of health care in a way which will increase its clinical and or economic effectiveness. Although St. Thomas has become a federally qualified center, the, an the annual FQHC grant of $650,000 makes up only 14% of our annual $4. million budget. We're unable to take full advantage of the augmented FQHC Medicaid rates since only 14% of our patients have Medicaid. 72% of our patients remain uninsured. <clears throat> Although the medic percentage of Medicaid-eligible patients will increase uh, in the future, we think this will take at least two years. Without the funds provided through the Primary Care Access and Stabilization Grant, it is difficult to project continued viability for St. Thomas. Although we are steadily moving towards sustainability with 72% uninsured patients, we do not expect to re have re replacement revenue to support our operations until there is expanded Medicaid eligibility. Certainly an early consequence will be the loss of the infrastructure necessary to support the policy and procedure requirements to remain a federally qualified health center and a patient-centered medical home. In our business plan for three years, we project that in beginning th year three, we could replace the revenues lost by the primary care access and stabilization grant. In the intervening two years, however, we cannot identify any source of adequate support, nor do we see any other safety net site in our region which would could absorb our patients. As you've heard, Hurricane Katrina created a new population of uninsured patients when the storm took people's homes, jobs, and health insurance. PCASG grant has enabled us to begin the restructuring of the delivery system in our state. We're optimistic about the sustainability of clinics like St. Thomas if we're giving another two to three years for the recovery to continue. But for the present, if there is no bridge funding, we anticipate that our patients will find themselves in the same situation they found themselves immediately post-Katrina, where the only source of primary care was the crowded emergency rooms. 
Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you this morning and for your continued support of our community. Thank you very much uh, for your statement. Uh, uh, Mr. Griffin. Good morning. To Chairman, Chairman Towns, Congressman Gow, and other distinguished members, on the com members of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to offer testimony in this public forum and ongoing health care concerns and challenges facing New Orleans region post-Hurricane Katrina. My name is Michael Griffin, and I am the Chief Executive Officer of Daughters of Charity Services of New Orleans, a primary health care provider whose organization has roots in New Orleans for 175 years with services to the poor and vulnerable. The Daughters of Charity Services of New Orleans, or DCSNO, is sponsored by Ascension Health. Ascension Health is, was founded in 1999 with the Daughters of Charity and the Sisters of St. Joseph joining their health ministries into one organization. DCSNO's mission is to improve the health and well-being of our community. And we are dedicated to providing primary and preventive health care services, which addresses the needs of the total individual, body, mind, and spirit. I welcome this opportunity to inform you of how pr the primary care access and stabilization grant program has assisted us in restoring the, and improving the health delivery system in New Orleans and what challenges are still before us. When Hurricane Katrina struck the city of New Orleans on August 29th, uh, 2005, it severely impaired the health care delivery system. Medical and other support personnel were displaced and the city lost several hospitals and numerous primary care providers. DCSNO was not sheltered from the impact of, of Hurricane Katrina. We lost our one and only health center, uh, health center site to flooding in the aftermath of the storm. Yet as our history demonstrates, the DCSNO board and Ascension Health would remain steadfast and committed to serving the poor and vulnerable in New Orleans. Within 45 days after the storm, we opened a new health center in the, in the Metairie area next door to the Department of Health. However, the diminished capacity of the overall health care infrastructure in New Orleans severely compromised continuity of care for low income and minority populations who were attempting to remain or return to the area. Katrina resulted in the loss of five hospitals, one of which served the vast majority of the medically underserved and poor. After the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, was a litmus test which challenged DCSNO to improve access to, to health care services as additional locations throughout the metropolitan area with the goal of meeting primary care needs of the community at large. It was because the primary care access stabilization grant awarded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and authorized by Congress that DCSNO was able to rapidly expand from one to three primary health centers in the area. Today, today, these health centers are currently providing primary care services to the underserved populations in the Carrollton area, the Upper Ninth Ward, and in Metairie. As a direct result of the primary care access stabilization grant funding, DCSNO has been able in this past year to provide affordable and free care to 20 <coughs> Uh, 20,034 patients, totaling 65,509 patient visits. 72% of those patients are uninsured. Let me, let me repeat that. 72% uh, of the 20,000 patients are uninsured. 15% are Medicaid, 5% are Medicare, 7% are on, on other insurance. DCSNO has experienced unanticipated growth in this last year of a 49 percent increase in our patient population uh, since last July. The primary care access stabilization grant funding allowed us to retain and hire new doctors. We are offering free pharmacy services. We have expanded access to mental health providers to both children and adults. We have plans to expand dental care and optometry. In addition, we have leveraged the PCS, PCASG funding to encourage partners like 
the Unity Foundation and the March of Dimes to help fund mobile primary care units, two of which are two mobile prenatal units and the other is one that treats the homeless. And to restore our Seton Resource Center for Adolescent and Mental Health Development that offers behavioral health counseling services at 10 public and parochial schools. Let me quickly tell you this, this story. I'll share this brief story with you. An uninsured mom, mother, who didn't have a regular physician recently attended a health fair staffed by DCSNO mobile unit, and she had a history of hypertension, cholesterol, uh, and glucose issues. While having her testing done, the woman expressed concerns about medical, uh, to our medical provider about her daughter complaining of not feeling well. She was constantly drinking water and going to the restroom. She wondered if we could just take a, look, a quick look at her daughter. We gave the nine-year-old a glucose test and found that the glucose level was above 300, which was extremely dangerous. Our clinician recommended that the mother immediately take her child to a children's hospital for further treatment. The child was, in fact, admitted to children's hospital where the emergency where the emergency room doctors informed their mother that any prolonged high blood sugar could have resulted in um, stroke or coma or, or even death. I tell this story because it demonstrates the type of community outreach we are doing at Daughters of Charity Services of New Orleans to help those who do not have health insurance and are, and are a family physician to call when the child gets sick. I thank you. Chairman Towns for this opportunity to testify before Congress, and thank you for su your support of New Orleans. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Griffin. Uh, Dr. Townsend, your statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to, to address you today regarding the status of health care in New Orleans on behalf of the Louisiana State University Health System. In addition to my role at the health system, I also have the privilege right now of serving as the interim CEO to the public hospital in New Orleans. When Hurricane Katrina forced the closure of the Medical Center of Louisiana at New Orleans, we did lose critical infrastructure for health care. We lost 550 inpatient beds. At that time, we were doing 23,000 patient admissions a year. We had 120,000 emergency department visits. But something that's not often recognized, and it's really important, we did more than 260,000 outpatient clinic visits in our hospital-based clinics, and that included primary care as well as specialty care. We had over 640 medical residents and fellows from Louisiana State University and Tulane University training at that hospital, along with thousands of other students, dental, nursing, allied health, pharmacy. It was a critical area for teaching for Louisiana, for the workforce, for the future. We lost all of that in Katrina. And when you look at that, the role of that facility, it wasn't simply for the New Orleans region. It was a statewide resource where people who were uninsured could go to get specialty care. Oftentimes, the specialty care isn't available to these folks, even if they have a Medicaid card in the rest of the state. We lost all of that from Katrina. Knowing the important role that this facility played, I consider these people who stayed there during the storm and reconstituted services after as really true heroes. They went from constructing tents in a parking lot where they continued to provide services. They moved those tents into the convention center because it didn't flood, so they at least had a roof over their head. Then they moved those tents into a former department store in the mall adjacent to the Superdome once the flooding subsided. And we continue to do specialty care and primary care clinics there today because it wasn't until November of 2006 that the former University Hospital campus was able to be transformed and reconstituted into an inpatient facility. And that was through the work and collaboration of FEMA and LSU, as well as Louisiana's Office of Facility Planning and Control. Today, we're operating 275 beds, about half of what we had before the storm. With that, we're running close to 85% occupancy. And as you look at hospitals across the country, 85% occupancy is full. Our ICU, we have 36 beds. 
they stay full all the time. We have 38 inpatient acute psychiatric beds for adults. They are always full. We also, we also provide the only level one trauma center in South Louisiana serving a nine parish area. We have 11 operating rooms, less than half of what we had before the storm. One of those always has to be on standby for trauma since we're level one. So we are cramming all of our operating room um, cases into 10 operating rooms in that facility. And as a well-respected physician in the community, someone who was there during the storm and after the storm said, we really are gaining stability, but we're still pretty fragile. We're probably one big bus wreck away from just crippling the entire system down there. So we still have a ways to go. One of the really exciting things, though, that did happen was through the generous funding of Congress, we got the Primary Care Access and Stabilization Grant. So we were able to bring six community clinics up after the storm associated with the interim hospital. And this was different from before the storm, where everything was pretty well located on campus. Now these six clinics are allowing quality patient care to happen close to where people live. And the quality is evidenced by the, the NCQA actually gave us recognition status as patient-centered medical homes in those community clinics. The grant funding was flexible enough that we were also able to, to provide some specialty care services. As we look at this, this funding coming to a close, we recognize that our role as an academic medical center is to support these primary care clinics. So we are looking at consolidating some of those clinics into the bricks and mortar rather than the temporary buildings that they're in now. But we see that access to the specialty care and inpatient care is extremely important. So we're trying to partner with the community clinics that are still there that will hopefully survive after the primary care grant goes away so that we can give important services to those folks. We don't just treat, we also educate. And we've got to do both of those together. So I thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today. Thank you um, very, very much. Um, Dr. Rowland. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Diane Rowland, the Executive Vice President of the Kaiser Family Foundation. And since Hurricane Katrina have helped lead the Foundation's efforts to document the needs and monitor the progress in New Orleans through two citywide surveys of New Orleans residents in 2006 and again in 2008. We are also planning our third survey in 2010 just to be able to assess how the progress has been going. All of our work underscores the importance of building a strong health care system to meet the needs of all residents of New Orleans as part of making New Orleans again a vital and dynamic system. You have heard from all of our witnesses of the fact that New Orleans did not have a fully operating system even before Katrina. And you have heard about the devastation that Katrina wrought on the city and on its health care system. But the devastation was so widespread that it also brought an opportunity to establish and design a better system with community-based services and integrated services for the poor and uninsured instead of a system based on a hospital and disproportionate share Medicaid payments to help sustain it. The public returning to New Orleans had many of the same problems of the public that left New Orleans. Many were poor and uninsured and many with chronic health problems. So Katrina <coughs> did not wipe away the problems of the residents of New Orleans. Adequate medical care, rebuilding medical capacity, and the charity hospital system, establishing care in clinics and neighborhoods were high priorities of the residents that we surveyed and came in next after rebuilding the levees, which as you might imagine, would have been their major concern. And as we look at a redesigned healthcare system, we need to look at the major elements that need to be put in place. First and foremost, <coughs> healthcare coverage provides the <coughs> means for people to access healthcare services and the financing to support a health care system. For children in New Orleans, there is a success story. Today, only 8% of New Orleans children are uninsured, lower than the national average. This is due largely to the expansion of coverage through Medicaid and the Law CHIP program. Today, in the city of New Orleans, over half of the children have Medicaid as their source of coverage, which helps account for the lack of a large uninsured population. 
But for adults in New Orleans, the story is very different. Louisiana, among the poorest states in our nation, one in four living in poverty, has one of the most meager programs in terms of eligibility for adults. In fact, a working parent cannot qualify for the Medicaid program if their income is over $5,513 a year or 25% of the federal poverty level. Less than <coughs> no coverage is available for childless adults and those who are in the city now, we account for 29% of non-elderly adults are uninsured. These are the same levels of lack of insurance for adults as before Katrina. And these are the very individuals who are now seeking care through the community clinics that have been developed and who will need care in an ongoing manner until insurance coverage is made available. Attempts to improve coverage have been stymied, leaving these developing health systems to care for the largely uninsured adult population. 72% uninsured is an unsustainable level of care to be delivered in even a grant-supported clinic. And the good news, though, is that the community-based system of clinics for primary care has been able to at least develop with the support of the federal grant funds. It is decentralized. It is in the neighborhoods where people live. A forthcoming Commonwealth Fund study that is evaluating these clinics has found that the patient experiences show very promising results on quality, on access, and on efficiency for these clinics. The investment in these clinics has helped to move a new model of care to the city of New Orleans and appears to be bringing much needed care to the city's still substantial uninsured population. But the bad news is that the future sustainability of these clinics is in jeopardy, largely due to the lack of coverage. And while we all talk today about national health insurance and universal coverage as part of the health reform efforts, those efforts are still not going to be phased in if enacted till 2013 or 2014, leaving a huge gap right now for these clinics to be able to continue. In order to provide them with the support they need. Coverage needs to be expanded. Many need to be able to become federally qualified health centers, and there needs to be continued support for the uncompensated care that they provide to individuals who are uninsured. Even in the models of community health centers around the country, we see that the mix of revenues that support them is grant funding from the federal government combined with the payments for their insured patients through the Medicaid program. And finally, a fully integrated health care system requires specialty care and tertiary care capacity, as you have just heard. So reestablishing a teaching hospital with multi-specialty care to back up the clinics is equally essential. Without improved coverage of adults combined with financial coverage for the uninsured, the neighborhood primary care model will falter, not in the care it delivers, but in its ability to sustain operations. Yet this is a critical building block for the future of New Orleans health care and a critical building block as we look toward national health reform. I hope this hearing will help to shed light on the needs of these clinics and the ability to provide services to the uninsured and the low-income population of New Orleans. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very, very much. And let me thank all of you for your testimony. You uh, have been very, very, very helpful. Uh, now we are going to the question and answer uh, uh, period. Uh, and I will start uh, by, by first asking, um, um, I guess, to you, um, Ms. Bassetta and Dr. Rowland, um, what would it mean towards the region's overall recovery to lose these services that have been described so eloquently here this morning? Well, I think that most importantly, um, the threat of backsliding on the progress that, have been, that has been made so far in the Primary Care Foundation is um, something that we would not want to see. Um, these clinics now and this primary care foundation that's been built is in an expanding mode. It's in a growth mode and reverting back to a less effective system where people would have to, re to uh, seek care in an emergency room would be more expensive and would yield poorer outcomes as you've heard. Um, in addition, like emergency rooms throughout the country, uh, they're, they're already at capacity. So um, it would be very dire to lose these primary care clinics. 
Right. Uh, Dr. Rowland? Mr. Chairman, I know your concern is for the people of New Orleans, and I think what these clinics have demonstrated is that they need access to care. There are severe gaps in their ability to get the care they need. We know that uninsured people get less care than those with insurance and that they live sicker and die quicker. So I think it's an investment not only in the clinics themselves, but especially in improving the health care of the people of New Orleans. And many of the low-income population there suffer from multiple chronic conditions that are not uh, readily available to emergency room care. So I think you really need to have in place a good primary care network and to sustain it. Right. Thank you very much. Let me, I guess, uh, raise this question with you, Dr. DeSalvo and Ms. Kraft, uh, Kearney, and Dr. Irvin, and of course, Mr. Griffin. Um, uh, yeah, as you know, the grant ends next year. Uh, I guess what federal assistance are you now seeking to be able to keep it going? Uh, just sort of run down the line real fast as to what you're doing to sort of keep this alive. What are you doing? Well, what we've done is um, work towards improving efficiency, quality, so that we are providers of choice for communities, irrespective of ability to pay. We work collaboratively in organizations like 504 HealthNet to ensure that we're sharing best practices, billing when appropriate, et cetera. So we're doing our best to be efficient operations. The reality is, as you heard, um, that can only go so far, including when patients contribute to their care, which they do. We, we charge sliding scale fees at these sites. And so the gap, um, the gap will need to be filled in much the way that hospitals have a gap filled for uncompensated care. It's just the DISH program doesn't support primary care federally in the way that it supports, um, supports the hospital systems. So in terms of gap, it may be additional appropriation. It may also just be thinking about ways that we can use existing funds that we have, um, for example, CDBG funds that we got for recovery that are now with the LRA to, that are for urban renewal, principally for housing, but thinking about the fact that without health care, it doesn't make a lot of sense to just build housing. You have to have the fabric. So that's one opportunity for bridge funding and then to think about whether we want to use a waiver for disproportionate share of money to support the clinics going forward until it's not needed because there's coverage for everyone. All right. They're right down the line. Um. The Lower Ninth Ward Health Clinic is moving towards sustainability by first making sure that we are Medicaid providers, Medicare providers, and private insurance providers. We uh, came up a little bit differently because we came up post-Katrina, truly a grassroots effort. So we are putting those different um, things in place so that we can become more sustainable. Also, we are looking to the philanthropic community to assist us. Mm -hmm. Dr. Irvin? Yes, sir. St. Thomas is a federally qualified health center. St. Thomas is a federally qualified health center, and as such, we get federal funds from that. As I mentioned in my testimony, that the, the financial base that's required to main the, maintain the infrastructure so that you can comply with the policies and procedures and the 24-hour coverage and that sort of thing, um, it, we're, we're working hard to, to, to try to maintain that. We, um, we, we have a, a sliding scale. We have increased our patient revenue, uh, money from funds from patient revenues from zero two years ago, three years ago, to estimated $420,000 this year. We, um, we were, are also, the mayor of, uh, of New Orleans has uh, granted us uh, $850,000 for our CDBG uh, funds, but this is a one-time only thing. Um, we, are, we have a $2 million allocation from the state but that's for capital improvements only, so we have to stay viable in order to be able to capitalize on that. We, we meet weekly, our staff meets weekly, and we go over ways that we can, that we can um, improve our sustainability, with, with not only with grants, but uh, with, you know, watching our costs as carefully as we can. And, and we, we, we have, unfortunately, with a 72% uninsured population, it's just very hard for us to, to, to find any kind of viable revenue that, that could replace this money until there is some expansion of Medicaid. We're told that there will be a substantial uh, increase in Medicaid patients who are el eligible for Medicaid 
Well, this will likely take two years. That's why in our, in our sustainability projections, we estimate that beginning year three, should this occur, the beginning year three, St. Thomas will actually be uh, able to replace the um, $3 million that we lose, would lose from the primary care access and stabilization grant. We expect to be self-sufficient in year three on the business plan. And we, as I say, we charge everyone that can pay. We get a sliding scale. And we feel ask the patients to take responsibility for helping us be viable. Um, but when we're dealing with a demographic of 72% uninsured, it's really hard. Right. Uh, Mr. Griffin, be briefly because my time has yes. expired. Da Daughters of Charity is um, uh, focused uh, on the growing our insured population as, as we are 72 percent uninsured. Uh, since Katrina, we have um, um, blindly accepted all who come, and that has been um, majority uh, adults who do not qualify for Medicaid or are uninsured. And so our peer mix is 72% uninsured. We are focused on growing arcade care and, and um, insured populations. We also are evaluating our expenses and looking at our care management model, um, which is pretty comprehensive, uh, and seeing how we could be more efficient, and also looking at fundraising. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, my time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the ranking member Congressman Issa from the great state of California. Um, Mr. Chairman, the great state of California is $140 billion or whatever upside down at any given time. Uh, actually, it's $47 billion right now. They've narrowed it. Uh, we're a state that uh, taxes at a rate more than 25 percent higher than Louisiana, and we've overspent. Uh, we provide a lot more public health assistance in California in many areas than Louisiana does. And I guess uh, Mr. Gao, uh, who of course is one of your representatives, uh, will probably uh, look more specifically into a lot of what can be done and what can be delivered from the federal government. But my questions are going to have to be a little more tough love, uh, not just because I'm personally a conservative, but because I have an obligation to California uh, in addition to the Constitution. Louisiana's top uh, tax rate is 8.4 percent. California is 10.4 percent. You have a 4 percent sales tax. Well, we have an 8.25 8 percent sales tax. Now, I know you're all health care professionals, but in spite of all of this, is everyone so poor in Louisiana that, in fact, the state cannot do more for you? Uh, I mean, is, are you going to be a permanent ward of the federal government? Because when I hear sustainability counting on Medicaid increases, uh, when I hear uh, Mr. Griffin saying, well, we take everyone, including those who are not poor enough to qualify for uh, Medicaid, then I'm extending Medicaid past what we define as the poor. So let me, let me ask you much more uh, the other part that I didn't hear. What is your state, and we'll have a second panel from your state, but what is your state doing to bring all the, the powers to bear of the state, including finding funding sources for you besides simply the federal government, because obviously the direct effects of the levies breaking, even if we put them all on the federal government, at some point that's paid out. And then we ask the question of what's going to make you, uh, uh, as a sovereign state, meeting your own obligations. And Dr. DeSalvo, only because I can see that, that you're, 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 you're saying, how is this guy asking a doctor this question? Would, would you help me with this? Because I know that all of you look to all sources of revenue. And, you know, you're doing a lot to, to build better doctors and better, better health care. But I have to ask, in the long run, where, what are you doing besides coming to us? And, and don't get me wrong, Mr. Gao is absolutely dedicated to make sure we do everything we can do. But if I could ask each of you that same question, it's, my, it's really my only question for the panel, because I see all of you as doing the right things within the structure that exists. You're getting money from all revenue that you can find. You're building great. Uh, solutions for people who come to you, and I don't, I don't have any quabble, uh, quibble with that. I totally see that. But I'll start with Dr. DeSalvo, because this is the question that a California member has an obligation to ask, in addition to a Louisiana member who is obviously going to say, we got to do more. Please. Well, thank you um, for the question. And 
I'll begin with the, the concept that, speak up, I'm sorry. The gentlelady from California can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay. Um, so when the federal levies failed and our city was destroyed, um, we began very early to work together to think about how we would rebuild this. And in education, for example, there's been creative thinking, just like there has been in healthcare. We did not, um, as a community of stakeholders and healthcare providers, um, think that there was going to be some manna from heaven that would fall to make it happen. And indeed, as Alice describes, and I tried to as well, and others, it's a it's a very grassroots effort. This clinic system. No, they, I'm totally. That's okay. I'm, I'm totally supporting there. that. My real question there. is, where is where is Louisiana right. where, coming where in, it and what, how and are I, they I going to help New Orleans? Because it's you're a state first. Cities are not actually directly recognized by the federal government. We recognize states. We are the United States of America. And in a sense, only states come to us. And when the next panel is up, I'm going to be asking them that same series of tough questions. What is this state doing uh, to be equal in its support of its people to other states? Yes, sir. The, so in the, I'll, I'll skip the tax policy, because I, I, I really honestly cannot answer the question. But I w what I was wanted to tell you is that for the past four years, the community has come together at policy tables, Democrats, Republicans, maybe independents, who knows, to think about ways that we could finance this kind of system. We have um, d developed at least three discrete plans, one the redesigned collaborative that was a mix of public-private coverage, another which was a, a, a affordable health insurance plan through private coverage solely called COLA, and another one that was a waiver that went in about a year ago to the feds to use disproportionate share to recover. Uh, to, to shift the funds, that we, money we already get, mm -hmm. as, um, but, that, but use it in a different way that requires federal support. So um, all to say that we have been working incredibly hard in Louisiana across party lines through two governors and have always come up with the same idea as a state. This is what we want to see happen. We need to figure out how to finance it. At this point, I can't speak on behalf of the state, but there are some things that do need to happen federally to allow us to move forward as a state, i.e., waivers for how we use disproportionate share money, um, how we might use the existing lo the recovery authority money that we got for urban renewal that might require some congressional action to allow it to be for urban rebuilding. Uh, anyone else that can, can answer just as to, you know, what you see your state doing? Because uh, Bobby Jindal was a colleague of ours, a friend of mine, and I, wanna, I want this committee and all the committees to work hand in hand with your governor to enable those things. But we're going to have to ask them the same tough question I'm asking you. So if any of you have an answer to that narrow question of, of how Louisiana is working to meet this sustainability requirement that you all talked about. Yes, uh, Dr. Townsend. Uh, sir, I think, I think what I, I obviously can't answer for the state. I, I don't sit in that role. But I think when you look at how health care is funded, there are really only three pots of money, and, and perhaps it's only two. I mean, there's either federal money, there's state money, or there's private sector money. And so I think one of the things that the state is trying to do is economic development, because if you have an, an employer who offers an insurance plan, then you have access to insurance that the federal government doesn't really have to participate in, nor does the state. So I think that's one of the ways. I mean, we have to improve our education. We have to improve our employment so that people have access to health care um, programs that, that don't necessarily have to be funded by tax dollars. So I think that's one of the things that's happening. And then, and then I think Dr. DeSalvo talked very eloquently about the other kinds of waivers and ideas for current funding, not to increase it, but to have more flexibility in current funding. And I know we'd like to do that. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your indulgence. I'm sorry we can't continue this, and, but I assure you we will be trying to f work together with Mr. Gao to make, uh, make those waivers happen as your state sees fit. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. I now call on a very active member of this committee, uh, of course, um, uh, Mr. Cummings from the great state of Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all of you for what you do every day to address the needs of so many people. And you don't have to say it. I'll say it. I've listened to your testimony. These folks have been left behind. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, you all are doing the best you can with what you got. And in answer to Mr. Ice's inquiry um, about tough love, you know, you can have tough love and die. And you have not provided the testimony yet 
but we've just spent a lot of time in the House addressing this issue of health care overall. And the statistics show, and the research shows, that some 45,000 Americans die because they don't have insurance every year. Other research has shown that 1,000 children die every year because of no insurance. So the question is, is that where does the tough love, how far do you go with the tough love if people are dead? And so let me ask you this. You know, we, this committee, Mr. Chairman, we had uh, some testimony a while back, and the members will remember this, where we were talking about uh, formaldehyde in trailers where folks were living in trailers getting sick, big time. And this was a while back, and we had, this committee pushed hard to get the folks out of trailers. And I just wanna, if any of you all can comment on that, I mean, where is that? Because a lot of your work would be made even harder when they told us about the ailments that resulted from folks breathing uh, the, those uh, fumes. Uh, it was it was very uh, quite devastating, and we were very upset. And we were just wondering where where is that stand? Can one person just tell me about that? One, somebody, please. My time is running out. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Irwin. Um, <clears throat> I would just take a stab at it. We still see patients who are living. I'm sorry, in Dr. Trails, Irwin. And we still see patients who have that. Is that we still see patients who are, who are living in trailers. We still pe see patients who are exposed to formaldehyde. And, and the problem as we perceive it is there's just not adequate housing for them to go to to get out of the trailers. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, housing is still not adequate. Is that what you're saying? No, sir, it's not. And I think going back to what you said, Dr. Townsend, you were talking about when you were answering Mr. I uh, uh, Ice's uh, question, you talked about uh, the whole issue of people uh, living, uh, uh, being able to have jobs, and so forth and so on. Uh, and what I said from the beginning was a lot of people have been left behind. I don't know how many people on this panel have visited the Ninth Ward, probably all of us, and visited New Orleans to see, even to this day, uh, areas that have not seemingly been touched that were destroyed. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, you, you, all t you talked about the three different areas that funds could come from. First of all, do you think that you all are doing the best you can with the funds that you have? You can go ahead. You, Dr. Townsend. Don't be shy. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. I, I do think that everyone is making a concerted effort to wisely use these dollars to make sure that we provide the best care for the most people in, in the most efficient way. So I, I think that that's happening right now. And you said something about you have one half the beds, but 85 percent capacity. Is that what you said? No, sir. What, I have about 50 percent of the beds, but the capacity. 50 percent of the beds that you had before, that we had before Katrina. the storm, but we're providing about 60 percent of the inpatient services. So even in the inpatient setting, we have become more efficient. Mm -hmm. and cost effective. And in the outpatient setting, we're about 80% of the outpatient uh, capacity that we were before the storm. We're doing about 80% of the visits that we were doing before the storm. Now, an area that I'm very interested in is dental care for children. We had a little boy in, uh, in my state who died, Diamante Driver. He's on Medicaid, but he died at 11, 12 years old because the, the tooth infection that would cost $80 to repair went to his brain and he died at 12. And I'm wondering, uh, Ms. Rowling, you talked about uh, children, only 8% children uninsured, but how are we handling our children with regard to dental care? Uh, what's going on there? Well, as you know from the case in Maryland, dental care is very uh, limited even under the Medicaid program. It's a covered right. benefit, but very few dentists participate. So that I think that is one of the areas that really has to be supplemented and, and helped in all the states as well as probably in Louisiana. But how are we doing in, in, in your state? That's what I want to know. You know, I, I think it, that dental care speaks to the broader issue of, of how 
Um, this community of health providers is working together to cover the territory. So, for example, some of the dental care is provided in mobile medical units um, by some of the organizations in this, and they have created a website with a, a map and a, a grid that will tell providers where people can go for dental care on any given day. Charity Hospitals reopened its dental care services. The Daughters of Charity will have dental care services, so, but we're not going to replicate that if we're just you know, a couple of miles apart. We're trying to be very responsible with the funding, but make sure that there's access to services. Thank you very much, Chairman. I see my time has run out. Thank you very much. Um, I now call on um, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Gow, Congressman Gow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, this extremely important hearing. I I, I, I know fully well of the uh, health care needs of the district, but before I begin in addressing those questions, I'd like to ask Ms. Uh, Bess Turn your mic, pull your mic back. Yes. I'd like to ask Ms. Uh, Bessetta, uh, do you see of any instances of waste, abuse, or fraud uh, that from the federal money that, that was channeled down to the, uh, the area for rebuilding purposes, especially in regards to the health care system? In, we, we have not specifically um, scoped our work to look at fraud, waste, and abuse, but in the course of our work, we did not see any of that ourselves, and we didn't hear about that from any other organizations, the IG or anyone else who might have been. So looking. based on the information that you have received so far, they have used the money responsibly? That's right. Okay. Uh, Dr. So, uh, Dr. DeSalvo, um, <coughs> I know that you are... Um, in charge of Tulane community-based health clinics. Um, how have you seen the increase in clinics help address the issue of the insured and whether or not this is a model that we should be looking at as a, as a nation uh, in order to cut down the health care costs uh, that we are struggling trying to, uh, to, to address? The goal, you know, the goal is to get people to go to the right place at the right time for the right care because that is not only better quality but it's more cost effective and, and primary care is the, usually the best place for people to go. Clearly emergency rooms and hospitals are a necessary part of the continuum but um, uh, all things considered, like the man I described in my testimony, he's better suited with his high blood pressure and his gout to be treated in primary care where it's about a quarter of the cost than the emergency room. And there's a, a, a fair number of people in Louisiana who fall into this gap. Um, they, they, they would not qualify for Medicaid, even, uh, even being quite poor. And if they, they are un don't have children, they wouldn't qualify. But most insurers in Louisiana don't offer health insurance. It's not affordable. And so this is a, an interesting model, PCASG, where we've actually taken funds. And though they're still distributed institutionally, we are paid not based upon volume, not based upon some sort of Oh, it's a given we're going to give you the funds. We're actually paid as organizations to take care of a set population. There's a high expectation that we're going to be available for those patients, provide quality care, do it in a very cost-effective way. We are, we are mystery shopped. We have satisfaction surveys. It's a pretty intensive oversight of our programs. But I think it's a PCSG is a really interesting bridge model for urban markets in particular that want to move away from hospital-based funding of care of the uninsured. There's, there's a, a gap until there can be universal coverage, but you want to make sure that you've distributed the funds so that all of your money is not in one financial, cons financially consolidated institution or place. What we've also learned is that if you pay providers for quality and value and you give us the opportunity to take care of populations instead of just paying us for volume, it naturally leads to team-based care and opportunities for innovation that I've never experienced before in 20 years in healthcare. Uh, Dr. Townsend and also to Dr. DeSalvo, do you have a, a system where uh, patients who show up in your emergency rooms to direct them to community-based health clinics? Yes, we do. At, at the interim LSU Public Hospital, when patients arrive at the emergency room, whether the care is actually emergency room appropriate or not, if they're not assigned to a primary care clinic, and, they, and particularly if they're uninsured, then we're able to direct them to a primary care provider in one of the community clinics where they can access care. And we work with them to try to make sure that they understand how to appropriately access the clinic and the emergency room when necessary. 
Tulane Hospital has been um, touched in a, in a fashion, of course, by us as, because we have clinics in the system, but touched by the leadership of PCASG, meaning very specifically going out and targeting and talking to the emergency room leadership, the hospital leadership, to be certain they're aware of the program. We update them with flyers and information about availability, and there's a website that they can go to, which I think you have information on, Geno Community, which will tell you in a zip code what's available, what the hours are, what languages they speak, what services they offer. Um, it's, we've been really aggressive about trying to get people directed from emergency rooms when appropriate um, in, into medical homes so that they don't continue using that other system. Um, how many more medical uh, community-based clinics do you see that, it's, that we will need uh, in the future uh, in order to address the needs of the people of the second district? And my question, another question to you here is, um, how, what steps do we need to take when the primary care access stabilization grants uh, ends, uh, how, how, how do we, what plans do, you ha do we have to continue these community-based clinics and to provide primary care to, to those who, uh, who are uninsured? Well, I, in terms of the number of, of providers, types, types and sites, I think that's a, a really great technical question that HRSA can help us with, and they've been um, thinking about that with, with some of the providers already. The, um, the 91 access points that we have are really varied in scope and size. So some of them are small school-based clinics or mobile units, so I, I certainly don't want the committee to walk away thinking we have 91 community health centers because we're not there yet, and I don't know if that's the right number. But it is an important planning issue we do have to decide, and the, the community certainly wants to work together to, to right-size it. And what, what plan do you have in order to continue these projects when, once, the, uh, once the primary care access grants uh, runs out or ends? You know, I, I think what you've heard today is that as long as about 72 percent of the patients who have to access those community clinics remain uninsured, then the sustainability of those, those clinics I think is really impossible without an, an alternate funding source identified. And like I said, there are really essentially two pots of money. There are tax dollars and there's private sector. And other than, other than grants and philanthropy and things like that, I'm, I'm not really sure that anyone is able to identify how are we going to keep this going. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, yes. time has expired. I now yield to, as you know, uh, we've just been called for votes, so we try to get at least two more in. Uh, Congressman Turney from Massachusetts. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to ask one particular question. Uh, we know that uh, sending children to school healthy with, uh, in a healthy state is a good thing or whatever. Have you had any examples of creative use of the educational funds and system in, in cooperation or coordination with the health care system that have helped you at all? There, there has been um, discussions and work that has been done. We, as, you, as I mentioned in my uh, um, presentation, we actually do uh, behavioral health in 10 schools. Uh, we're actively having discussions with the school system about expanding that. Um, there also have been um, numerous efforts and expansion in school-based health centers uh, throughout the state as well as in the uh, New Orleans area, and that's a more comprehensive uh, provider model that has uh, medical, behavioral health, and other services included in those locations. And so um, there, there are, I think, approximately nine school-based health centers in New Orleans and several more in the metropolitan area. Uh, so th those uh, efforts are ongoing in collaborating and coordinating with the, s the, the, the school systems. Thank you. If nobody else cares to, uh, you, Ms. Bassetta. We had a companion report in July of this year that we issued on uh, mental health needs of children in New Orleans, and we noted in that report, which I can provide for the record, that school-based health centers were an important uh, model in the in the area. Thank you. There being nobody else wants to comment on that, I'd like to yield to Mr. Kennedy, who I know has uh, some pertinent questions he'd like to ask. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank the gentleman from Massachusetts. Um, I'd like to ask, um, for those of you who would answer, what percentage of those coming into the emergency rooms exhibit uh, mental health issues uh, and addiction issues? And to what extent do you attribute any of the PTSD, obviously, to the, uh, to the natural disaster? And if you could address the issue of 
the trauma that was exhibited as a result of uh, the hurricane and to what extent there was a lack of uh, proper mental health services available to address the needs of folks. Um, from what I understand, clearly um, trying to get people's uh, mental health needs met have been a, has been an endemic problem. Um, and clearly the uh, enormous crime rate in the area now, you know, I kind of feel like our uh, criminal justice system is a substitute uh, in a kind of a last um, sense uh, for our mental health system that isn't there. So I'd ask you to kind of comment on the lack of a mental health system and also what you see as the uh, consequences of that today in terms of the number of people showing up with uh, mental health issues in our health care system as a primary um, source of uh, issues and whether you can reimburse for that given the exclusion that many insurers have if people come in with an accident that you can't reimburse for it if they have alcoholism, if they've been drinking alcohol or ingested as a result of uh, drugs that many insurers say they won't insure because uh, that's quote unquote a deliberate thing and they won't allow you to get reimbursement for it. If you could comment on any of those issues. Mr. Kennedy, at the Lower Ninth Ward Health Clinic, we have seen many come in with mental health problems. We had a young man who was known to us who came in and said, I just want to slit my wrist. We had to get him some help immediately. But we just want you to know that many of the mental health problems that are taking place, the, what's happening is because there was a lack of services initially. Um, and there's still ongoing problems with the mental health piece. We're, we're, we're at a point where we're actually diverting and, and sending people to the correct places, but initially there was a big impact and people are suffering from depression, this underlying depression. And I might be okay today, but tomorrow I might not be. So you're seeing people who are just very, very fragile and we don't know what is going to be the breaking point for them. So there's ongoing assessment of that depression. And what I did want to say was that the criminal justice system comes into place because many times people are below the radar. Mm -hmm. I'm okay today, but you don't know what's going to happen to me tomorrow. So what happens is they become in, entangled with the criminal justice system. And what happens is right now our biggest provider of mental health services inpatient is the Orleans Parish Prison, unfortunately. Mr. Kennedy, in our surveys of uh, the residents of New Orleans in 2006 and 2008, the need for mental health services was quite apparent. But one of the striking things we found was in 2006, one year after the hurricane, people reported that their mental health status was fairly good. I think because so much was going on in their lives, they didn't really focus on it. But by the time we came back in 2008, we saw much higher contact with the health care system, much more frustration over inability to get the medications they needed. And today saw that 15 percent of those in New Orleans reported that they had a severe mental illness, such as depression or other things. So I think you're pointing out an area where the population has severe needs and will be going back in 2010 and hopefully will find better access than we did in 2010. Are you integrating mental health to the white coat docs? I'd like to address that if I could, sure. Representative. Um, one of the other recipients of the PCASG money is the Metropolitan Human Service District in New Orleans, which is a public entity responsible for a, a, most of the mental health funds. Working with the, with the uh, state, Secretary Levine, Governor Jindal, they, they addressed the fact that uh, immediately afterwards the, 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 about the only place for mental health was jail. So that the <clears throat> we've put into place yeah. forensic uh, assertive community teams, assertive community teams, adolescent community teams. There's been a, 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 a remarkable, I think, improvement in the coordination of care with the Metropolitan Human Service District, which had some problems pr prior to Katrina, has, new, has a new executive director, new medical director, and is, and has, uh, is implementing 
last week actually, a very coordinated call center where if a patient shows up either in the hospital or jail, something like that, then it's very, very uh, close to, to being coordinated so that the case manager will know that the next day and that they can follow up on that. Also ways of following up when people don't get their prescriptions filled where they should. So th th I think that, that um, they're not represented here except for me, I'm on the board, and, and it, is a, it does represent a real success for, for uh, the, Metropo for the um, pr primary care access and stabilization grant, and I'm really happy to get a chance to help you understand that that's made a huge difference in a, in a very dysfunctional problem that we have. Right, let me, uh, to your question, we have integrated at almost all of the sites mental health services into primary care. It's one of the benefits of this program is we can have the warm handoffs if I identify somebody who seems depressed or anxious. I have services right on site. I don't have to go home, send them home, or refer them out. The flexibility in funding has, has allowed that uh, through this program. Right. Let me just say that the uh, gentleman's time has expired. Um, we have uh, four votes, uh, and of course, um, uh, we will reconvene at 12.30. And of course, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the Barbara Lee, the chairperson of the Congressional Black Caucus, be allowed to sit and to ask questions. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, we will reconvene at 12.30. And of course, the votes are now, and we have four minutes left on the vote.